Uh, my name's Paul Chaffers. I'm the Technical Events Manager at NAPET. And joining me on the line is Richard Townsend. So Richie's going to come in and give us a bit of advice as well. Yeah. OK, yeah. so. Oh, are you there, Rich? Yeah, I'm here, mate. Oh, good stuff. So uh, we're looking at the effects of external influences on electrical installation work in gardens. Now, BS 7671, it doesn't really classify gardens as being anything special. It's not under any special installations or locations. However, there are increased risks to consider. The external influences play a big part. They can have a detrimental effect on equipment and basic protection can then foul um, if the equipment is not selected correctly. So you need to, when you're doing your designs, you need to look at the fundamental principles of the wire and regs, which requires that when you design electrical systems, the safety of persons, livestock and property is essential. And the designer must consider all the risks of danger that could arise in the electrical installation. Now, you start off by looking at an assessment of the general characteristics. BS 7671 Chapter 30 provides the following characteristics which need to be considered. So the first one is the purpose uh, for which the installation is intended to be used. So whatever you're doing in there, you need to look at who's using it, what's the purpose. Then you need to look at the general structure and the supplies that are present. Next up, you'd look at the external influences. I've got that in bold because that's the topic of today's consideration. So it's a, a part of the chapter 30 requirements. You also need to look at the compatibility of the equipment and its maintainability. This one is more for buildings, but recognise safety services and the assessment of continuity of service. So we look at all those things when we're doing our design. So when we're talking about external influences, we need to look at the classifications which are in Appendix 5 of the wire and regulations, OK? And each condition um, is designated by a code comprising of a group of two capital letters and a number as follows, OK? So we've got the examples there on the screen, which are in the regs book, and we can see that um, the letter A gives us the general category. So it's the environment, OK? And then we look at the second uh, letter, which gives you the nature of the external influence, OK? And then you get the number, which gives you the class within that external influence. So we're just going to get Richard to come on uh, line now and just talk you through this um, set of codes we see on this screen now. Yeah, so 7671, if you look in Appendix 5, we'll talk about AD codes, which is essentially uh, the deer's presence of water. We'll talk about AE codes. Um, which is present foreign bodies. We, you don't generally see uh, an AD or an AE code used on the front of um, uh, a piece of equipment. You would have to use, say, for argument's sake, AD2 and AE2 um, for a t an IP23 box. We refer to it, as I just mentioned, as the IP rating because we can use both in the same um, sort of wording. We use ingress protection, which covers both uh, water and solid objects. So you'll generally find, as uh, referred to in this uh, within the electrical industry generally, uh, an IP code. But they're sort of taken from uh, AD codes or A codes or external influence codes and put together to, to into a more usable IP kind of um, understanding of things. So if we're in a garden environment and we're going to start looking at socket outlets and um, plastic boxes and stuff like that, or metal boxes, anything we're going to put some kind of termination in. We're really going to be looking at IP56 or IP65. You'll find lights lower than that. You'll find outside lights in the IP44 range uh, and so on. That's OK because they're, they're going to be out of way and they're just taking a bit of rain. But for this, we're talking about garden power. So we're putting power into a garden. So we need a little bit more. So generally, um, we're looking at around IP56, IP65 sort of level. OK, thanks, Rich. So moving on from that, so we should be on slide seven now. So from a designer's perspective, you've got to take into consideration the different seasons of the year. So we're looking at, uh, it's all like going to an installation and they want you to design some stuff that's going to go in a garden, middle of summer, nice and warm, nice and dry. 
Um, that's not any good if you then got to take into consideration frost, damp, uh, water, uh, any kind of um, uh, fauna growth or, or drop back in fauna. Or you might have some animals um, entering the garden. You can have hedgehogs, you can have deer, you can have fox, you can have all sorts of things which could then have an impact on our external influences. But protection against water is the highest on our priority list. So it's not a case of designing something for use in the summer because you have to sit there in the winter and all of the rain and everything that gets thrown at it uh, until it gets used again. So we have to think about these things when we put together our installation. We have to think about all four seasons and everything that could possibly interact with our installation. So if we look at this, this is a, um, it's a this is supplying an outside uh, tennis court in someone's garden. OK, so regardless of the planking plate that's missing, uh, everything's tightened down quite nicely. It's glanded OK. Uh, there's no water getting in, it's dry inside. Um, so that's pretty good. That's a pretty good install. However, other parts of that installation didn't fare quite so well. So if we can just go to the next slide, Paul. There we go. So what we've got there is that's now that uh, the first slide um, gave us a look at where the power came from. It's now going to the bottom of the lighting pole. Obviously, that's a metal box uh, and you can see the water is dripping straight down that pole, straight into that metal box. So there are there is some damage inside. So the design's fallen down there. Probably not the best place to put it. It probably may have been better suited if you got a drip tray above it, which then would protect uh, the box from what going into it, maybe put it on a stake separately to it, have a piece of cable coming across, lots of different ways, but putting it down there is a bit of a fail um, because the installation was going so well uh, until we got to that point uh, and the box is literally starting to rot away. If it's left, that's going to cause us a problem uh, and it's going to cause a significant problem. We're going to be starting to look at maybe uh, some shock issues. Uh, we're going to start looking at maybe uh, that metal structure, which is the, the lighting for the tennis courts, becoming live. So, uh, right. So, we've also got to look at some of the other external influences we've got, okay, which is uh, the AN variety, which we refer to, comes from uh, Bendix 5, AN, solar radiation. It's a significant one. We've got to look at it. An awful lot of equipment we fit now is plastic or PVC or variations of a theme uh, and UV over time will make that brittle or it will make it susceptible to uh, water ingress uh, which could then damage the insulation resistance of a cable. So we have to think about cables that have got either some kind of screening material i.e. so we're going to put them in a conduit or we're going to put them in some kind of protection or we'll select materials that are specifically UV um, hardened or UV resistant. So we're looking at colour coatings and types of cables and colours of cables. So if we can get Paul to take a look at uh, uh, cable choice in a, short, in a short minute, but just to go back to there, cables installed in direct sunlight will need to be rated accordingly. We do see lots of twin and earth stamped across houses and buildings and in gardens. However, the UV stabilisers inside those uh, are not really up for direct sunlight. So we don't really want the use of PVC twin and earth cable outside in direct sunlight because the manufacturers are saying to us it will break down. We could have um, water, you know, the plastic can start to take up water, not huge amounts, but enough that could possibly damage the insulation resistance. So we know, need to start thinking about different types of cable. They're generally going to be black in colour. There are lots available. We don't have to use twin and earth we can use three core flex. Um, that's quite an acceptable cable um, for doing outside installs. Just because it's three core flex doesn't mean it's just for machinery or equipment types. It can be used to put an insulation together, provided it's put together properly, clipped and contained adequately. So I'm just going to hand over to Paul now and he's going to talk about some of those cables we've got there. OK, thanks, Rich. Yeah, some good points there. Um, what you can see here is actually the outside of the horse stables. OK, um, so I think the uh, the right hand side of the image, that is a, a water pipe and it's not a cable. So we're looking at the cables there that are cleated. 
and the conduit. The installers used SWA. They've used um, conduit for mechanical protection. So we've looked at the mechanical protection. We've probably got an IP65 light switch there. All great stuff. But what they failed to do is look at the requirements um, for agricultural, because we've got horses there now. And if you look at the next image, we've got um, the inside of the stables. So when the horses come out of their little stables, they walk past this junction box on the way out into the yard. OK, now it's not the best clipping that we've ever seen. I mean, it's a bit excessive on the on the top there, the, the space in between clips. But the main issue here is mechanical protection. The horse could easily lift its head and have a little chew on those cables if it wanted to. Um, Richard, what would you say about that? Uh, we've got to take, even though this is in a garden and it's someone's horse, pet pony, Shetland pony, whatever you want to call it, we have to abide by other parts of the regulations, even if it's in a garden. So 705 Agricultural Horticultural, 705 522 specifically states that any locations accessible to or enclosing livestock, uh, wiring systems should be erected to protect uh, from damage from them and to, uh, and to make sure there's no uh, inaccessible uh, or no accessible equipment that can either be damaged by them or cause damage to those um, uh, livestock. So we need to look at now that box that's just been fitted. Can that be chewed or damaged by a horse? Yeah, absolutely. They'd make mincemeat of that plastic box. Those glands, those cables, yeah, that, there's no protection there. Horse could get a bit curious, have a good chew and lunch on one of those. Um, we know that uh, livestock is extremely uh, sensitive to uh, electric shock, far more than us, uh, and we could have a serious incident. So that box would need to be either put somewhere else, um, preferably made of a different material, uh, and those cables would need to be shrouded or protected in some way or constructed in some way so that uh, a prospective uh, occupant of that stable couldn't get hold of them. OK, great stuff. So we've just talked about mechanical damage, which is classification AG. Um, it's got to be considered. Um, and given the nature of most gardens, it's expected that tools will be used and cables should have a certain amount of resilience against accidental knocks. Take this um, junction box here. This was actually in a pub garden. So we're coming away from residential now, but it was in a pub garden. And you can see the curbstone right um, at the front there. So, so it was accessible to the general public. And it's quite obvious that somebody's put their foot on the cable at some stage when they've been standing there having a cigarette or whatever and it's broken the box the box may be brittle because it's been there in the sunlight etc etc and it's broken away and it's now left um, a potentially dangerous situation because we have basic insulation exposed okay so very very serious um, to get these things right to make sure that when you're doing an installation you consider all the possible effects of these external influences okay so moving on with the cable choice frost can also have a detrimental effect on cables and that can also be when you're installing them if you're working in real freezing cold conditions and you're bending them they can become brittle and they can cr make crack generally i think um from memory it's about anything less than five degrees we need to start uh, looking at that so you know some very cold situations but it can happen and some installers use blue arctic to combat that however it doesn't really offer mechanical properties um when you look at bs7909 it doesn't really recognize um Arctic cable as being suitable for temporary installations and it's for the same reason it may have good properties against frost but it doesn't have the properties for mechanical purposes okay so therefore uh, 7909 and a lot of the um, special parts of the wire and regulations make reference to heavy duty rubber type cables such as HO7 RNF um, as being a suitable cable. I believe that's in a few places in the part sevens, Richard, isn't it? 
Yeah, we uh, HO7s, uh, you know, it's a it's a pretty hefty lump. You, you'll find it in swimming pools and construction. Uh, it's used in swimming pools because it uh, does actually have um, uh, the ability to resist uh, taking on water. I'm not saying all cables are like sponges, but we are talking very, very, very minute over periods of time. So um, used in swimming pools, construction, uh, you'll find it used in generator industries as well because they like that nice uh, heavy duty cable that can be uh, take a bit of stick. Do you know what I mean? We can, we, yeah. we can give it a bit of give it a bit of heave ho um, from the temporary industry sort of perspective. We if can you, we can put cables around. If you've got cables on a construction site and they're taking a bit of a knock, rubber tends to bounce back, plastic tends yeah. to crack and split. So. It's um, it's still you still got to be mindful of how you do the installations. You can't just throw it in and forget it. But um, it's a much better, heavily, uh, you know, protected cable. Um, in actual fact, we're doing construction sites next week, so I won't dwell on that too much. Um, okay, so we mentioned the blue Arctic. Here we have a, a picture of there's a little garden light on top of that pillar. Um, now it would probably would have been a better installation if somebody had mounted a, a box directly over that cable and the flex wasn't on show um, and, and the armoured cables were glanded in and out of the bottom of the box. However, it's been done for this way and I don't know why, but you can see that some silicon has been uh, put in around the top of the gland and that was possibly because there was a, um, a tripping issue here with RCDs and somebody sat to go round and reseal all of those boxes against uh, the effects of water penetration. So you can see you really do need to consider what you're doing with outside installation work to get a, the longevity of the installation with no uh, callback problems. Okay, so we've talked about rubber having better resilience than PVC, um, but it could still be susceptible to vermin damage. You need to bear that in mind for any deck lighting installations. Um, Quite often you'll see cables clipped under a decking um, or thrown in in any fashion because the installers felt that the decking is providing the mechanical protection and it's providing the shading, et cetera, et cetera. But quite often under decks you get vermin crawl in there. So you just need to be careful that, you know, you can't discard the need for mechanical protection. Next up, we're going to be looking at buried cables, OK? Now, Regulation 522810 deals with buried cables and it goes along the lines that unless conduit or ducting is used for protection against mechanical damage, the cable should incorporate an aft armour or metal sheath or both. Um, so typically steel wired armoured cables uh, would be selected and suitable for direct burial in the ground. Um, Richard, we put this table in the on-site solutions, didn't we? And I know that, you know, we've brushed on agricultural today, but the, these are the areas that the regs talk about buried cables. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so when people say, well, regs don't really mention buried cables and this, that, and, you know, how, how deep should it be? Um, again, these are the areas where it actually does specify something. So we can see agricultural caravan and marinas require a depth uh, and in an agricultural area with a lot of traffic, we're looking at added mechanical protection. Everywhere else, it's uh, where foreseeable ground disturbance could be expected, it's a half a metre. That doesn't mean that um, in your garden, you're going to dig down half a metre. Um, it's generally sort of taken that it's going to be uh, significantly less. It used to be about however, however long uh, your average shovel would be before you came into contact with the yellow tape. So whatever that would be 300, 350 mil thereabouts 400 mil thereabouts um, and then a little bit underneath that you find your sand and your cable if you're going to concrete over the top of it or it's going to have slabs over the top of it then i wouldn't see that as for seeable ground disturbance being expected so you could reduce the depth i'm not saying you can have it on the ground because that's too far reducing but you do have to think about uh, Appendix 5 again, external influences. And an external influence could be a buried cable. What what could influence that cable while it's buried? Could someone drive over the top of it, a heavy lorry? Um, and we could put sand over the top of it. We put rocks over the top of it, which could dent into the uh, uh, an armoured cable if it was buried. You're going to use some kind of troughs. You're going to use, you know, th there's so much to think about. So 
when we think about buried depths of cable, we've got to think about what's going to affect that cable while it's in its place uh, and what could uh, be expected to happen to the ground or the land that's on top of it. If we're not driving vehicles on the top of it and we're not digging it a lot and we're not ploughing it, there's an argument we don't have to go quite so deep. So that's why the regulations don't actually state you shall bury a cable this deep uh, as a general because we just don't know. As a general rule, we like to think it's um, in excess of half a metre. Again, that's only guidance. So we have to think about burying cables more about what we about the individual insulation uh, and as a designer that's what you've got to look at absolutely absolutely correct okay so for let's say a driveway where a car is going to be going over we want to take that industry guidance of about half a meter um, the best procedure is to remove any sharp rocks or stones and fill the trench with a generous layer of sand stick the cable in and then cover over with another generous layer of sand that way that the cable is going to be compacted with a solid uh, surrounding of sand. OK, backfill the um, the trench with sifted soil um, and dirt and then um, install a marker tape. Um, I've always laid them at about 150 from the top and then that way if the customer or somebody was to start digging their garden fork would pull out the tape before any damage occurs to the uh, cable. OK, so next up, we're moving away from cables now. We're going to look at power in the garden, OK? And a lot of times customers, unless it's a really big, fancy, expensive garden, everything's uh, fully hardwired back to control panels. Quite often, socket outlets are a convenient way um, to provide power in the garden, OK? They should have a suitable IP rating and additional protection by 30 milliamp RCDs. Um, the RCD can be at the origin of the circuit or it can be at the socket outlet itself, depending on whether the cable needs uh, RCD protection or not. Um, they are a convenient way to install uh, power to the equipment. Um, we've got a picture here. So what we're showing here is that we've got our SWI cable cleated along the wall. It's out of harm's way and it is um, able to withstand a few knocks and scrapes uh, along that wall. We've got a RCD socket outlet. And what we've got here is one of those IP rated adaptable boxes with the little jowl strips at the bottom that allow the cables in and out. Um, we've got an extension lead from the socket outlet feeding the four way unit there to do some lighting control. I think we've got an LED driver there for the for the spotlight and it's also plugged into timer control for the customer so that it just comes on automatically or not alternatively you could have some smart home controls with um, remote control switching and we've got a little um, water feature there now what we've shown is what Richard has said there is in this instance nobody's going to be really digging under those shrubs too much but they may be doing a bit of light pruning so you want the cables to be um, adequately protected um, so the addition we've shown a bit of additional protection with some uh, conduit there and we're probably not going to need to bury that at half a meter with a marker tape because it's quite obvious that it's feeding that light um, it's in the same location somebody should be able to see there's electrics there and therefore we can scratch it in just uh, you know a couple of hundred millimeters down just to keep it out of harm's way so um Hopefully that makes sense. I'm sure many of you guys have done similar installations, but that's a perfect way of uh, of giving the customer some power. They've got some spare ways there in case they want to plug anything extra in. Um, we've got a spare socket outlet in the socket outlet itself so that they can plug other tools in without having to remove the the cover off of the IP box. So there's a lot going on there. Um, you've got lots of flexibility and it's a good way of working. OK, so next up, we're going to talk about garden lighting. OK, now BS 7671 section 714 deals with outdoor lighting installations. Garden lighting is is referenced within the scope. You can see I've put it in bold there. Um, but most of the installations listed in this section of the regs refer to public areas. We've got road signs and we've got parks and we've got and the gardens bit is not clear. Is that a domestic garden or is that a a garden that's open to the public so it's just garden so it's got to include all 
um, and we've got places to the public and we've got all these other things there. OK, excluded from the scope are temporary festoon lighting, road traffic signals and luminaires fixed to the outside of the building. OK, that are fed from the internal wiring. That makes sense. Look at 7144133. It requires 30 milliamp. RCDs for telephone kiosks, bus shelters, advertising panels and town plans only. So it suggests that apart from any general requirements to use RCDs, it suggests that garden lighting can be installed without RCD protection. So now let's look at some of the general requirements within Regulation 41134. Um, it provides additional requirements for circuits with luminaires and states that 30 milliamp RCDs should be used for AC circuits supplying luminaires within domestic household premises. So the question is, does within the premise mean lighting fitted inside the building only or does it mean anywhere within the building or its grounds? Now, this is quite interesting, uh, Richard, because when we looked at the consumer unit regulations back in the day that said non-domestic, uh, sorry, non-domestic, where it said non-combustible consumer units must be installed um, within the premises. A lot of industry guidance said inside you had to have a metal board. If the outside wasn't in close proximity, proximity to the building, there was no risk of fire spread. An outbuilding could have a plastic board. So using the same sort of terminology in this regulation within the premises does it mean that the outside is excluded or, or what so uh, you know it's a, it's a good topic that me and Richard have been discussing and we feel whatever the true meaning is that NAPIT would re recommend the use of one or more 30 milliamp RCDs for garden lighting installations and that way uh, there's no confusion and we've gone down the the path of safety uh, for such installations would you agree Rich? Yeah I'd agree with that Great stuff, great stuff. OK, the next topic is hot tubs. Now, this is a little section on its own. And when we were putting these webinars together, we asked, um, we reached out to the technical guys and, and Trevor, our technical uh, manager, said that he's been getting a lot of calls on their technical helpline regarding hot tubs, uh, whether it's people that are stuck working from home, have invested in hot tubs, or whether it's just the time of year, but um, a lot of calls. So we've decided to dedicate a little section on hot tubs here. Now, there's no specific requirements for hot tub installations um, within the rigs. Uh, hot tub installations located outside don't really fall into locations containing a bath or a shower, which is covered in section 701. Likewise, not all types of hot tubs fall within the scope of 702, swimming pools or other basins. So um, that may become clearer as we go through this, where I've said not all types, because don't forget we've got hot tubs that are built into the foundations and we've got ones that just simply plug in and blow up these days. So, uh, you know, they pump up not blow up as in explode, <laughs> let's hope not anyway. So 702 for swimming pools could be used as the basis for a safe design, okay? However, it does state in the scope of 702, it states that some pools are designed within the scope of an equipment standard, and therefore they fall outside of the scope of the regulations in 702. So uh, we need to be looking at manufacturer's instructions. That is a, a definite. 702 does allow for socket outlets or switches to be installed in zone two, and it provides the requirements. OK, so you can use south. You can use electrical separation and you can use additional protection by 30 milliamp RCD. And I've put that in bold because I feel that would probably be the most appropriate and the most popular choice. The electrical equipment must have IPX4 or IPX5 for jets. Now, Richard's already mentioned a lot of things outside would, would be sort of IP65 and we would need to allow for jets because a jet would be classed as someone using a garden hose. Um, it's quite acceptable that they may be cleaning their hot tub with a garden hose or the the floor around there so ipx5 as a minimum for 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 my recommendation 
So looking at zone two, we're allowed to put sockets or switches in zone two if we're going along the lines of following uh, section 702 for swimming pools um, and basins. This is a basin above the ground and zone two is two metres away. OK, so. This hot tub here, um, if we could get our power supply there two metres away from the edge, which we could it, um, quite easily, then we've met section 702. However, if it was a little bit closer and the manufacturer agreed that that was acceptable, that may be OK also. Let's face it, the external influences that the switch gear is going to be subjected to are catered for. We've got an IP65 rotary isolator there. If somebody flash, splashes it from the hot tub, there's no big deal. So we've got to use a bit of sensibility with this. However, if you're required to install to section 702, two metres away and you're absolutely fine. So next up, we're going to talk about manufacturer's instructions. I'm going to get Richard to uh, run through this slide if, if he doesn't mind. This is the lazy spa type ones, Rich, the the, the pump up um, yeah, yeah. hot tubs. Other, other manufacturers are available. Um, <laughs> kids, you know. um, so you, you get these uh, installation uh, instructions. Please bear in mind that they may have been translated from Chinese or Indonesian or, or, or something else. So they tend to not be too great. So the manufacturer uh, is giving you advice. So Paul's already pointed out, this is, these are equipment, okay? A spa, a pump up spa or a portable spa is a piece of equipment. It's designed to an equipment standard. So therefore it's kind of out of the scope of 7671, okay? It's not, a, all we're interested in is getting power to it. And because it's not specifically um, referred to in 7671, we refer to Appendix 5, external influences. So we're gonna put one of these um, devices close to some power, so we need to think about that a little bit. But we also need to be um, sort of guided by the manufacturer's um, instructions. So they will say selected uh, location has to be able to support the uh, supporting of the expected load. OK, so we need to think about the weight that, that's going to go on there. Adequate drainage. Yeah, fair enough. It's a spa. Then we're not start talking about the power. Uh, and we've got here risk of electric shock before inserting the pump into the plug, uh, make sure that it's uh, working correctly, which is OK. But that one doesn't really give us a, a lot in, in the way of distances from um, an isolator. It just says these are the warnings, but it doesn't say anything else. So there's an argument there that we might want to think about what 701 and 702 say. Bear in mind that this is an equipment standard and doesn't totally fall in line with 7671. So you've got to use uh, a little bit of um, uh, engineering sort of advice to you. You know, you've, you've got to think about these things as yourself. You've got to use a little bit of engineering and ingenuity uh, initiative. So let's say we're going to fit some kind of socket outlet that's going to be resistant to splashes um, close to our device. OK, so we've got standard twin socket outlet there, OK, uh, and a different sort of device here, a force eight supplied with both a lead, a lead and a plug. And the force eight is a type of um, portable mobile hot tub. It states that the RCD protection or, or, the, or the cable that comes with the device has got 1.5 to 4 metres uh, and needs to be plugged in within that distance to the spa location. That doesn't mean to say that it comes with a 4 metre lead and you've got to be 4 metres away. It just means it comes with four metres of cable. So you may have to go in or around obstacles. You may need to go above at height and clip it over the top of a wall. It, it just means that that's what it comes comes with. But what it's really asking you for is to be at least 1.5 metres away. Um, the socket must be within four metres, but certainly away at least 1.5 metres away. That's the manufacturer's advice, OK? So don't use an extension lead or a plug type cord of any kind. I think that goes without saying. You wouldn't, you, you wouldn't want to reel out an extension lead and just plug it in within 1.5 metres. Again, appendix five, external influences. But what we do need to think about is um, the amount of socket outlets we've got on our two gang switch socket outlet there. If we have that within 1.5 metres of our device, our piece of equipment, it's got the option that someone can come and plug something else in. 
which then could actually find its way maybe into the hot tub, radios, music system, something of that order, mobile fridge, cool beers while you're sitting in your hot tub. So for us, maybe think about only supplying the power there in a single socket outlet so that the only thing that can be plugged in is the hot tub or something else. And if the or something else is plugged in, it means the hot tub's not plugged in and therefore keeping it a bit safe. OK, thanks, uh, Rich. Yeah, th that is actually um, from a foresight set of instructions that you have to prepare ready for your installation. So they want to wheel the hot tub in, install it, and have a socket within 1.5 to 4 meters. That's a requirement. So you can easily put it two meters away because they've told you you've got a four meter plug on it. However, if you want to be within 1.5, the manufacturer would support that as long as you put one of those IP type sockets on. OK, so let's have a look at another set of instructions. Now, this one here, um, not sure what the brand was, but it's written a little bit better. But it points out that we've got a, we've got in that middle paragraph there, it says they will provide up to five. Let me get me mouse and see if I can highlight that up to five metres of cable. OK, they will supply that with a tub. OK, so you can easily put it a little bit out of the way if you want to. Yet again, they're showing a double socket outlet and that's good advice what you've said there, Richard. So strange. And then on the bottom, they obviously do larger hot tubs that come with a 32 or 40 amp supply. It looks to me that they've written their guidance in accordance with 702 because they're asking for two metres away for the IP um, outlet, the IP rated uh, isolator, should I say. So manufacturer's instructions will quite often provide the key to how to install this equipment. So looking at another hot tub, as Richard said, we've shown it with a single outlet there to, to prevent anybody plugging in and resting something on that wall that may fall into the tub. So that's a good, good thing to do for your clients. And you can see there that that is the pump up type um, that anybody can buy uh, and plug in themselves. OK, so you're going to be asked to provide the power. You're going to advise your customer to plug it in in a suitable position in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and away you go. Lastly, one of the other questions that comes up a lot on the technical outline, uh, Trevor tells me, is that people are saying, can I plug a hot tub into uh, PME? So we're going to just talk about PME in here and I've got an image here um, that is in the on-site solutions and it's fully, fully discussed and described in there. So we're just going to have a quick run through. You know the problem with PME. You've got the combined uh, neutral and our pen conductor. And if it is to to get broken and become un, um, you know open circuit, then all the load current trying to get back down that conductor is going to find its way to its MET and out to the exposed and extraneous conduct parts of the installation. OK, so that's a serious shock hazard with a broken pen conductor. Also, you can have a perceived shock. Um, so in the image here, we've got a paddling pole um, and the ground is saturated and it's setting up the conditions um, for this perceived shock. You've got the guy there at the bottom, he's barefooted, enjoying his barbecue and he's put a beer fridge in the garden. It's a class one metal object in the garden. It's years old and it's leaking some milliamps to earth. OK, and in this case, instead of the um, leaking current going all the way back down, finding its way to the property and all the way back down and returning down the pen conductor, OK, it's decided it's going to go through the saturated wet grass to a nearby earth position. Now that could be anywhere on the network. It could be a neighbouring pipe. It could be an extraneous pipe underground anywhere. It finds its way back to earth and therefore you're going to have a difference in potentials and you will receive a nasty, um, unpleasant tingle, which is known as a perceived shock. So there's two shock hazards with PME earthing. Let me just return to the picture of the hot tub. Richard, um, could we receive one of those shocks from that fully insulated hot tub and that plastic socket there? Only if they were damaged. Because 
any uh, Earth leakage would be confined to the CPC and returning back into the uh, the earthing installation or the installation earthing system. Um, if the casing of the pump or the pole or the socket were damaged, then yes, you possibly could. But that wouldn't be the normal operation of that equipment, which receives some damage, therefore needs to be repaired. So if it's a, a class two or, or heavily insulated piece of equipment, it's unlikely uh, to have the same characteristics as the, um, the, the fridge contact that we, you, you gave earlier because this is completely insulated. These, these devices are generally totally insulated by, by design from the manufacturing standards. So I don't see that that's an issue unless it was damaged. And if it's a damaged of course, um, then there's no regulation that we can protect people from if damaged equipment is used. That's a completely different ballgame. OK, great stuff. I'm just going to flick back to the previous hot tub. OK, same thing here. It's there's not going to be any exposed parts and the hot tub will be built to a product standard that it'd be safe to sit in. They're not going to want you to sit in something that could become live. So there's no issue with using PME here. Now, let's just go back further if I can find it there. This is the 702 from the wiring regs. Let's say you're doing a hot tub that's built into a leisure centre and it's concreted into the foundations and it's got some metal steps out of the foundations up to it. This is a different ball game, isn't it, Richard? We need to look at 702 now. Yes, if, if it's more. More more a custom built sort of design uh, and not something that's built by a manufacturer, we've got to look at what's closest to a hot tub well uh, it's it's been heated and it's got some kind of circulatory device and it's got some kind of chemical dosing system well that says to me it's a swimming pool because i'm heating some water up i'm pumping it around i'm filtering it i'm cleaning it i'm applying chemicals monitoring them chemicals so you have to monitor these devices to make the, make sure the water's uh, you know clean not got any harmful bacteria in um so that that means to me that, that that's a swimming pool. The water was designed to be in there for long periods of time. Think about 701. Uh, we're not really warming the water when it's in the bath. OK, we're not really filtering the water while it's inside its bath. Uh, neither are we adding chemicals to it to keep it clean while we're in the bath, because as soon as we've run our bath and used it, we, we, we run it away. So you've got to be careful here. We've got to think about things. What's our device closest to? Uh, in a hot tub in this scenario, it's closest to 702. So okay. be guided, guided by the requirements of 702, I think. And 702 doesn't um, prevent the use of PME, but there are certain precautions that have to be met. And I believe you have to put a copper mat under the swimming pool and it's got to be under 20 ohms or something like that. Um, don't quote me on that. But what we're trying to point out here is that the standard hot tubs that customers uh, quite often ask us to install um, we feel they can be installed um, quite adequately outside, providing you take all those external considerations, the manufacturer's information into account. And I think that kind of brings us to the end of today's presentation on hot tubs and external in influences. As I said, all of this stuff is covered in the on-site solutions, or the majority of it is. We've certainly covered perceived um, shocks and outbuildings. Um, likewise, if you're coding anything that has problems with external influences, you could use the code breaker 